to this lecture, Dr. Conover. Um, she is a professor in the Department of Physiology and Neurobiology at the University of um, Connecticut. Um, she, this is her education. She, she did her PhD in England at the University of Bath, and then did a postdoctoral fellowship at Midland Clinic, uh, UPenn, and then she went to industry, uh, worked in industry for a few years, and then decided to come back to academia. And she was a Rockefeller for some time, and then uh, went to France, Jackson Lab, and then finally settled down at the University of Connecticut, where she is now a professor. Um, she is visiting us uh, to give this lecture, of course, and also to be present as an external advisor for Redley's thesis defense later today at 11. So welcome, uh, Joanne. Uh, she has had a, a great impact on, so that, uh, on publications, and you can see her, her work here being uh, very well cited and funded by the NIH. So we're privileged to have you here, Joanne. Um, thank you very much. Thanks for the kind invitation. It's um, great to be here. Um, I'm coming from a stem cell developmental neurobiology um, laboratory um, that I run. And um, so what I'm, I'm going to talk to you today about, uh, since the time is sort of short, is really just um, focusing on one portion of our work. And it's really taking us from aging. Um, so some published work that we already have to development and so doing that whole route and hopefully you'll be able to understand the thinking behind why we um we can see it in this sort of way so okay so this is from one of our review articles and it's not a... i think you can use the mouse but... oh okay i mean that's fine and so um what this is showing is really if we start in a very early development, you have um, essentially the neural tube. And the neural tube is surrounded by neuroepithelial cells, which are shown here in blue, um, the actually purple. And as um, we go through development, it's showing mouse, but human is actually very similar. As you go through development, you have um, the um, generation then of the um, of new neurons that are going to then track up the radial processes of, of these um, stem cells. The stem cells are then going to generate new neurons, uh, not only new neurons, but uh, glial cells, including oligos, astrocytes. And they're also going to generate these yellow cells, um, these epithelial cells um, that are called ependymal cells that will line the ventricle and are multiciliated. And so we, um, we, um, so we look at, we use mouse as a model system, but we, um, we want to have applications uh, to human, of course. And so this is just showing um, in adult mice, the retention of stem cells as you go through development. This is this barrier layer that's been laid down. And the stem cell bodies now are relegated to just below this, uh, sub, uh, this um, appendable layer. And so there's only a thin process that then contacts the CSF, which is here. And they have a primary cilium on, on, their, um, on this thin process. Um, so there's a generation of new neurons, which is shown here in red, and this continues into old age in, in the mouse and, and other non-human primates as well. In the human, um, what we have depicted here is um, that it's now known that neurogenesis uh, stops um, pretty much after the age of two in humans. And so you have this glial or astrocytic ribbon that's shown here, and then um, a gap region that's um, full of astrocyte processes. And then you have this barrier layer as well. And what I've depicted here is um, a potential 
quiescent stem cell because it's, it's not really clear if these stem cells um, are um, retained um, through adulthood in a human. And so one of the questions that we had early on is, well, what happens if there are no stem cells? What happens when you um, see, um, when you see uh, ventral ventricular megaly that happens um, in aging? And so this is um, data that we got from WashU from their OASIS study. And we just took the cognitively normal individuals. So we did, it's an AD study. We didn't take their AD samples. We just took the cognitive normal and we, use their MRs and we, um, sorry, I'm not very good with this mouse. Um, oops. Um, and we used their MRs and we subtracted out everything except the ventricles, which are shown there. So a normal male, male at 30 years old and then a male at 86. And these are sort of just representative, but you can see from the, um, the graph that after the age of 60, you have, um, you can see this increase in ventricle size. From the longitudinal study below, you can see um, that one individuals um, start on a trend to ventricular megaly, it tends to continue. Um, but you can also see that there's a fair number of individuals that are in the normal range. So this is where most of you guys are. So, um, but even in 90s, uh, you can have individuals that have, at least in our cohort, we had individuals um, that had what would be considered normal um, ventricle size. And so, of course, that's where we all want to be when we're in our 90s. Um, so we were really curious about not necessarily what, what was the cause, because there's going to be various different causes of this, but we were interested in what happens to the wall, because you have those yellow ependymal cells that I showed, and they're very tightly adhering to each other. And in our mouse studies, we found that they don't like to stretch, so they won't stretch. Um, and if there's no stem cells for any regenerative repair, um, what's going to happen to this wall? And so this is just um, showing an example when we overlay um, an 80-year-old um, scan um, and 80, uh, 85 or 86 years. Uh, so six years later, you can see in red um, where there's expansion. And so we were curious about this and we thought, oh, is there some way of, is there some course that people tend to take, um, expansion in certain regions, we couldn't really find anything. Um, and that's part of the problem with human studies, like you essentially have an N of one each time, um, just because of all the background history on, on, on patients. So we took um, post-mortem tissue samples um, from um, subjects who had enlarged ventricles, and when we looked at uh, the tissue, what we found is that we had regions, which are shown here in green, where the, I'm, I'm so much more used to using a laser pointer. Um, so we have regions where you have um, ependymal cells shown here in, in green. So these are the barrier cells and they're outlined with beta catenin, so those adherence junctions. And so you can see nice regions of um, fairly cuboidal, uh, ependymal cells, um, but then you see regions where there's excessive astrogliosis and scarring along the ventricle surface. And so we found this in all samples of um, brains where we had ventricle expansion. And so we started this, um, okay, this just shows that um, in two different subjects that we're looking at here, one has an enlarged ventricle, um, actually had AD as well, but maps onto this from our previous data. And the other one had a small ventricle, a normal side ventricle. Both were in their 80s. And we not only had the scans, but we also had um, the tissue and the tissue is shown here clearly, the AD large ventricle um, and the other brain sample. And what we did was um, we went through this whole process where we took the MR, we did 3D reconstructions, um, and then you can do the same thing in mice, either with slice culture or now, now or slices. Now we're using MRs as well for mice. Do your 3D re reconstruction. You take the um, lateral ventricle wall, you make a hole mount out of it, and you do your staining of it. And the staining in this case of the red indicates astrogliosis along the wall because you're looking straight down on the top of the wall. So you're not going into the tissue here. 
it's straight on the top of the wall. So there's astrogliosis in red. And then normal ependymal cells shown here in green. These are very much zoomed out. And then you can color code it. So green indicating where it's normal ependyma and then astrogliosis in red. And then we can use um, the 3D reconstruction to map onto well, 2D um, and then generate a map of, of what the ventricle wall looks like. And so in the case of the large ventricle um, subject, um, we did this and here are some uh, uh, examples of the stain that we saw, nice appendable cells here in astrogliosis. And so this is a whole region in green where you have normal um, ependymal cells. And then you have these regions of scarring and yellow indicates sort of this quasi in between state where we, we didn't see clear ependymal cells, but it wasn't clear scarring yet. So it was probably a transition period. And so we could do this um, for our samples. And the 80 year, uh, 86 year old who had um, the normal size ventricle, I was really curious about what would happen because I thought, oh, with aging and wear and tear, um, there's probably going to be some astrogliosis. When we looked at the surface of this uh, subject's ventricle, uh, we had just clear, beautiful, nice ependymal cells. Um, so this is really quite reassuring. Um, but again, the cephal sizes are, are small, and um, but um, here you can see in 80, at 86, you can have uh, complete intact ependymal lining. Um, and so- I'm Sorry, John. Yeah. What was the cause of that? Um, yeah, that's where it gets complicated because we got um, the samples of the cause of death um, for the large ventricle was associated with AD. Um, the other one, oh, um, sorry, this study was from a while ago, but I, I'm pretty sure um, the cause of death was maybe linked to diabetes or something like that but, but not, nothing to do with the brain no nothing to do yeah no nothing to do with the brain something unrelated um but um yeah I, honestly i was still sort of surprised i thought there might be a little bit of astrogliosis along the surface you know just normal um but but there wasn't it was clear and clean um and so this just shows a summary in in mice you have um an aging you have decreased numbers of stem cells that occur. Um, and these stem cells sort of cluster in these units, which I'll, I'll go over in a, in a minute. And um, th they contact the vasculature that um, sort of defines the stem cell niche. And then in contrast with humans, uh, the neurogenesis ends at, the, at about the age of two. And that neurogenesis is indicated here by the red cells. Um, maybe there's still some quiescent stem cells, but typically in aging, uh, you have this astrogliosis that occurs, the edema that occurs as well. Um, and so it's, it's a very different scenario, mouse and human. And so this, um, this just represents probably some of the problems that um, occur is because you're now replacing these multifunctional ependymal cells that are multiciliated, and so there's laminar flow that they, they're associated with and transport um, both with the interstitial fluid of the parenchyma and also the CSF. And now you have a glial scar, so that's really going to alter um, and is likely the cause of, of the edema. And so we have um, other published works on, on these types of studies, um, but the problem with aging is, <laughs> It's very complicated and unless you have life histories of people and, and a lot of other data, it's, it's really hard to make conclusions. And so, and also using mouse as a model system is, is not ideal because it's, it, it, they're not very similar. And so we wanted to go to a stage where we could use mouse as a model system. And that really took us to um, early development. Um, at that time, um, the stem cell niche um, along the ventricle system is very similar in mouse and human. And so this is just showing uh, 13 weeks to 21 weeks and the development and the changes that um, occur um, and to the organization of the ventricular system as we go through early development. And so we're looking at the stem cell niche that lies along the lateral wall here. 
um, and how it changes over time. And so we started a study um, looking at mouse development. And this is, um, this is a busy slide, but if you just look at this panel here, um, the ventricles are, are shown here in blue. Um, the yellow in the ventricles indicates ependymogenesis. And so there's a wave of ependymogenesis. So new ependymal cells as barrier cells go from the, the caudal region of the brain um, to um, the rostral re region. So there's a back to front um, wave of ependymogenesis that happens. And this is shown as you crest through. And so the yellow now, the new immature ependymal cells are now coded as orange as their mature ependymal cells until you get to P30. So embryonic day 13 to P30. And now you have complete coverage of the, um, the ventricle lining with ependymal cells. But there's also retention of stem cells, um, as I said before, and the retention of stem cells are these green, I don't know how well you can see them, but green little dots. Um, they're represented in the pie charts as here as well, um, going caudal to rostral um, throughout. And um, the retention of those stem cells um, was really curious to us. How do, how do you retain, if you're having ependymogenesis happen, why don't you just use up your stem cells as, as it moves across? How do you retain some stem cells and how do you retain them in a specific pattern? Um, and so we looked, that was in mouse. And so we looked at human and we found out that it was the same in human, that you have this um, posterior to anterior wave of ependymogenesis and retention of stem cells. And the stem cells are retained in the same way that they are in mice, that there's a single apical process of the stem cell and the cell body lies beneath this barrier layer. So very similar in organization, but by the age of two, um, well, this case, we, we, the next sample we had from seven months was eight years, and we don't um, see any stem cells remaining at eight years. And all, this is another sample from 39 years. Again, no stem cells attached to the lateral ventricle wall in these two samples. So we were interested, as I said, in not only the progression of this, but how you maintain stem cells in these clusters. And these clusters are, some of them are outlined in purple, where the purple just are those ependymal cells, the multiciliated ependymal cells, and in the core are the stem cells. And these are termed pinwheels. And what's interesting is every time you have a pinwheel, that's essentially a regenerative unit. So that's capacity for some regenerative um, capability um, with, within that cluster. But why do you retain these clusters instead of just random stem cells um, if you're going to retain stem cells? And so this became a big question in the laboratory. Um, and I should point out the difference in human to mice is that um, mice, the new neurons, um, neonatal, in neonatal um, neurogenesis, in mice contribute to the olfactory bulb, whereas in human, um, humans, they contribute to the prefrontal cortex or the migratory pathway to the prefrontal cortex and a smaller one to the olfactory bulb. So neurogenesis seems to be important um, after birth um, for these different regions, but it's not really clear. And that, that's a whole nother project that we're doing in, in the lab as well. But when we did, the studies, not only did we look at the cellular organization along the wall, we also took MRs and um, here you can see in red, um, the ventricles as they change as you go through development. We took ventricle volumes, we took surface area, and what you'll notice here is there's a plateau at about the age of two. Well, what happens at the age of two? You, you have your pentamal lining already laid down at the age of two, and so, in order to increase in volume, you need to add more cells. And if you don't have the stem cell capacity to add more cells, um, it's going to stabilize. And remember those ependymal cells are sort of tightly adherent to each other. They don't like to stretch. And so you have this plateauing of surface area um, of the ventricle. And this is shown here. We did curvature analysis um, and a around the age of two, it, it really solidifies and, and there's not much change in the ventricle. There's not much um, uh, change in curvature 
um, and surface area um, that we found. And so putting this all together um, is a summary slide here where you have um, a pentamogenesis starting from in humans, the posterior and moving to the anterior as it replaces stem cells, but some stem cells are retained. Um, you start with immature ependymal cells, they become mature. Um, you still retain some stem cells in these pinwheel clusters. And then, but um, in our sample of eight years, by this time, we don't see any retention of stem cells. Um, and so giving rise to this organization. And so we moved on from this and we thought, <clears throat> well, in order to figure out how this all works, you could do a lot of lineage tracing and it would take a lot of time, but what if we go to predictive modeling instead? And so, and so if you imagine that this array is a lateral ventricle wall and each of these hexagons is a stem cell, and then you have this progression from from the back of the brain to the front as you lay down these ependymal cells. And in the core are retention of stem cells. Um, and so if you have this occurring, um, how does it occur? And is there some way to predict, predict how it's going to occur? So in the core, there's typically several stem cell processes. And we think that the ideal situation, because remember there's curvature, um, along this sur surface, so it's not flat. But if it was flat and it if it was perfect, um, we think that in the core there will be six stem cells and surrounding it would be six of these petals or six somatic cells. So how do you get that? Well, if a stem cell divides asymmetrically, <clears throat> it will renew itself and it will generate one uh, ependymal cell. And so maybe in that way, you can create this cluster, this regenerative unit. And so this was our very simple um, sort of clean um, version of how to look at that. It's become much more sophisticated than that. And I'll go through some of, some of what we're doing right now. So to start with, um, as I said before, you prepare the lateral ventricle wall, you do your staining, you, get, um, you can differentiate different cell types, you can probably see these clusters of um, green dots here, which are the basal bodies of cilia. And so these are the mature pendable cells. And then um, you can label the different cell types. And then we get this peas and carrots um, scenario that comes from, from this sort of image where the um, orange are the mature pendable cells and the green are the stem cells. And so we do this at different time points through development and we have full cell counts. We also have the surface area changes that, that occur. And so I think you can start to see how we're going to do a predictive model from this. Um, and so this is just showing, we do the lateral wall. This is at different time points, embryonic 13 to P30, you can see stem cells. And then finally, um, um, appendable cells make up the majority, uh, but you still retain stem cells. And this is just showing numbers um, as we go rostral, middle, and caudal sections because there's this wave, so you can't just clump everything together. Um, you really need to see how it goes from caudal to rostral. Um, but eventually, as you go through time, embryonic 13 to P30, um, you get um, majority of mature ependymal cells and reduction in stem cell number. We also did this for the medial wall. Now the medial wall is different. It doesn't retain stem cells. Um, and so we were really curious and it makes a good control because in this case, um, so it's the second column in each of these, you get to full ependymal cells much more quickly and you don't retain any stem cells. The other thing to note here is that the stem cells don't form little processes and then sink below the, the barrier layer they are retained at the surface. And so we thought, okay, well, this will be an easy one to figure out. You have a starting number of stem cells, you know the surface area change, and you have an ending number, number of pendulum cells. So it's sort of simple math, right? Um, how do you get from one to the next? And so we're using something called Markov chain Monte Carlo method. How many people know about this? 
Okay, so there's no physicists, there's no, there's no computer people. Okay, um, so this, this is just um, my son's a computer engineer, and that, when I told him this, he said, Oh, mom, yeah, that's math. Yeah. <laughs> um, Monte Carlo, oh, everyone uses that. That's <laughs> Uh, but this is um, the model that we're using. So if you start with a stem cell here, and um, there's a probability that it will form two stem cells. So that's the metric division. Then there's a probability this stem cell instead will, P2, will form one stem cell and one ependymal cell, asymmetric division. And then there's probability P3 that your stem cell will just form a pentacle cell. And so this starts and lays out our predictive model for how we're going to look at this um, and how you might end up getting this pinwheel organization that we see. So one stem cell, P1, is generating two stem cells. Um, P2 is asymmetric division. And P3 is generating two appendable cells. So those are our possibilities. There's also P4, which is complicated. I'm not going to go into that now. So hopefully this is, so what we're using is this program, graphing program, that um, <clears throat> allows us to do this predictive modeling. So it's GeoGebra, so that's why I put the, ge the zebras in there. I might have put zebras. Um, and so what you can do here is you can then change the probability. And so if you start, this is very simplistic. Um, if you start with 10 stem cells, so this black line, 10 stem cells, and then red are your appendable cells. And so the probability um, P1, we know that doesn't happen very much. One stem cell doesn't generate two new stem cells because we know that there's a decrease in number of stem cells. I mean, it can happen, but it's probably rare as, as you go through development. Um, and so you can change that and make that very small. And, um, oops, and, and then it changes how quickly you get um, your final number of stem cells. And so we can take all the data that we have, all the cell counts that we have, and then start to model as to which um, which probability is happening, which method of division is happening at different time points to give the end result that we're getting, the number of cells that we're getting. So we can, um, so that's just how, how it works and then it changes. And the purple line is really um, sort of the stem cells that are going to remain. So again, you can, we know that asymmetric division does occur and, and so that would raise the, number of stem cells um, to appendable cells. Let's see if I can get out of here. You can just click on the top of the question. Oh, there it is. Okay, so, um, so really, um, this is just showing um, again how, how this works in static form um, and the different um, divisions that are going to occur and, and the predictive capability. And so, in this case, with the probability of P1, so symmetric division of being 0.3, P2, um, asymmetric division of 0.1, and P3, and just generating appendable cells is one minus those two. So, in that case, it would be 0.6 you get 88% um, appendable cells um, within a certain time frame, essentially. Um, and then you can change that up and you reduce the number of symmetric divisions to two stem cells. And so you much more quickly get to your appendable cell number and so on. And it's a little bit more complicated than that if, and we have to put in all the other factors as well. But that's essentially uh, what, what we're, um, um, that's essentially what we're trying to do. And when I said the medial wall is the easy wall, because we know that um, P1 should probably be close to zero because you're losing all your stem cells on the medial wall. And so if you just put that at zero, and P2 at zero as well, because asymmetric division will give you a new one stem cell and just have all of 
the cell is just generating a pendulum cell. Then we can see whether or not um, we get the end result. We get uh, the number of appendable cells that we find um, at whichever time point we're looking at in that um, particular case. Um, so if we start with uh, the number of stem cells at embryonic day 16 and we go to P30, we have X number of stem cells, all stem cells, and then we have only appendable cells. And then we throw in surface area and the size of the cells to make sure that everything matches. And then we can see if in that case on the medial wall, you just, because you don't retain any stem cells, you just go from um, a stem cell to two appendable cells and that's it, end of story. And so why are we doing this? I mean, why? I mean, it's okay, it's a sort of interesting thing to do for development and to understand development, but really the, um, the other application. Let me just tweak on any part of this. Um, and really the application then um, is another project that we have in the laboratory is um, we've generated a hydrocephalic mouse model. And so you can see how we can then apply it depending on when hydrocephalus sets in in this model. We can, and we know how many stem cells we start with. We can then apply it to that situation. So do you use up your stem cell population too quickly? And in that case, you're not allowed, you're not able to generate all those appendable cells that are needed to, to line the walls. So, um, those are some of the applications. Um, those, this is um, my acknowledgement slide. Um, the current graduate students in my laboratory, uh, former postdocs and graduate students. Um, we have a great group of undergraduates who are working on the projects as well. Um, some of our collaborators, and then um, some of the current um, graduate students in the laboratory, and a few undergraduates. And I don't know if I went over time, but um, sorry if I did. And I, if there's any questions, and I'm sorry, you could have interrupted me throughout this talk class. Yeah. Okay, so I have a couple questions. So the first question is like, the enlargement of the ventricles in the humans um, during aging correlates with the shrinkage of the gray matter? Like, or, or which one comes first? Do they go exactly. together? That's, that's the question. Um, I don't know the answer to that. And really the studies we were doing, we were doing it more, what happens and what is the cellular organization after it happens. So my feeling on that is um, it often comes, especially from neurologists, it often comes that, oh, the gray matter is, is lost and then the ventricle enlarges. But if you think about it on a cellular level, and tell me if I'm wrong, the pentacle cells are tightly together, and we know that. Um, and probably anyone doing surgery probably knows that to some extent. Um, and it's not going to just flop open. The only way you're going to have expansion of the ventricle is that if you have increased pressure um, within the ventricle, because it's, it's not going to flop open. The only way it will flop open is if you destroy that appendable lining, then absolutely. And you'll get, but you have to get a glial scar there. But the glial scar is scar is going to be much more plastic than the pendulum lining. And so that's my thinking on it, that it doesn't come from the outside in, it, unless it has something to do with the core plexus and there's an overproduction. But in aging, there's actually a decreased production of CSF. So, um, but again, each individual is different. And so that's, that's sort of why we left that field because it's very hard to say something definitive and we wanted to be able to say something more than just um, sort of superficially and development really gives us a bigger opportunity to, to compare mouse and human and, and get some data. And the other question I have is that during development in the mouse tissue, uh, especially in the medial wall, um, you see the disappearance of the stem cells. Can you revert that at the early stages? Like, um, I don't know, can you, can you stop the disappearance of the stem cells or can you get them back somehow? Oh, that's really, really interesting. Um, 
No, we don't know. Um, I, I'm not sure how you, you would like stop you, it. Maybe like if you, I don't know, neurogenesis is usually induced by, you know, when you need it. Like if you have a damage in the cortex or somewhere, could you restore the presence of the stem cells? Yeah, you probably wouldn't want to because that's, you know, where would they go? Um, they would go into the septum and... Um, I don't know, but um, it will be interesting to see. No, it could, that is, it, or yeah. like if you can, like, you know, at that early stage, when they're just like, you know, they're very dynamic, I guess, if you yeah. could modulate it somehow. Well, the whole question about that is, is really interesting because why are they lost on that wall and not on the other wall? Um, nobody really has an answer to that. Um, and it could just be stem cells we know can only go through so many divisions. So maybe they started earlier and that, that's their end point. Um, but no, that's a really good question and thought. Um, yeah, we hadn't thought of that. Uh, very nice work, very interesting. Thanks. John, do you see growth of the third or fourth ventricle in aging? Or does it only happen? You know, we, we only looked at the lateral. Um, but I, it's mainly the lateral uh -huh. that, um, from what I know from the literature, it's mainly the lateral that that takes. So in that case, it would be interesting to compare the, the lining of the ventricle at the third or fourth to see what happens compared to what happens. There are no stem cells there, or not as many stem cells there right. uh, throughout at all in life, but to compare just how you did expand or yeah. not. Okay. Yeah, I would assume that it's going to. Well, the thing is, I think what's a value is that astrocytic um, ribbon that it's it's like a stop say that if there is expansion for whatever if you lose your pendulum cells you have those astrocytes and they're proliferative if if you have expansion so they'll proliferate and fill in so making that scar so I you know the third ventricle doesn't have that so but if there's astrocytes around, so right. I'm assuming that it might be similar in mm -hmm. expansion. Mm -hmm. but yeah, and so it, I don't know if you guys do um, any shunting for um, um, for children, yes. but um, you can get uh, slip ventricles, right? And so what is what is the thinking on slip ventricles? Like when when what do you think went wrong if you're child was shunted and then developed slip ventricles. I think there's no expectation on, uh, at least my knowledge, there's no expectation on who would get slip ventricles for something, but it tends to be with, um, it tends to happen more with over shunting, but sometimes even with sort of like shunting at an appropriate pressure, if you will, uh, some, patients would get slit ventricles, uh, and not only in peds, in all populations, well, it's more common in peds. Uh, and I think there's no sort of like clear uh, explanation behind that, but the theory is when the pressure is low, so that it's not sort of like uh, pumping the wall of the ventricle to kind of stretch or develop more. So at some point that sort of like it, ventricular enlargement or growth would be arrested at some point. Yeah, so my theory, and I could be wrong, is um, that uh, you're right. Um, but the thing to remember is that these, uh, the lining is made up of these appendable cells that have really long cilia. And we know in our mouse models that if you, <clears throat> if those cilia get all tangled up, um, they, those, cells will die, those appendable cells will die. And so if you're shunting and now you have, I always describe it this way, you have a grape and now you've made it into a raisin because you decrease the surface area. Um, those cilia are all going to be tangled up. Those appendable cells will likely die. Um, if they die and if there's no regenerative capacity or too many of them die, there's not good enough regenerative capacity then you're going to be, it's going to be replaced with a glial scar. And I know from the neurosurgeons I've talked to that going into a 
a slip ventricle is exceedingly difficult um, to enter it. And I think it's because it's all, um, it's no longer appendable cells, it's, it's now scar tissue. I mean, I could, I could be wrong, this isn't really my area, I don't, I don't do the surgeries, but um, that's from a cell biologist's point of view, that's how I would sort of view it. I, I don't know, maybe I'm, I think it's wrong in some way, but does that make sense to you? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Another question about the mice models that you guys are using. Um, so you um, you collect the appendimal wall, right? And you do a lot of uh, immunistic chemistry. Can you grow that tissue in, vit in vitro and like do yeah, organic? Yeah, you could. Yeah, and, and that's something that we want to do. At some point, you can grow appendimal cells um, very nicely in culture. Um, and, no, I'm sorry. And yeah, no, like the entire structure, like uh, do organotypics and see yeah. if they will develop the same way in vitro than it happened in the brain. Of the oh, you mean the same organization? Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, that's something we've always have wanted to do. We, we haven't done it. Um, you would sort of need the right setup. I mean, it's a little bit difficult because if you just add the cells and but you know, that's the thing with um, organoids. You probably all know how organoids are being used extensively for everything. There's a lot of self-assembly that you think, oh, that couldn't possibly happen. And then you just put the cells in culture and they self-organize or self-assemble. So um, yeah, that's a really good point that, um, and that would be a fun thing to look at to see how that organized. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as far as as far as like the composition of the cell lining, but in early development, yeah, yeah. Um, well, as I said, there's this. Um, if you look in fetal development, like past twenty one um, weeks, um, you see this formation of the new appendimal cells. And so that's a whole process that's going on until essentially until until birth. And so you have that difference because the um, posterior to, is the posterior to anterior wave and it's going across things. So um so it's essentially the same between the front and the front. Yeah. Oh well you know we didn't we didn't dissect it so thoroughly. I mean there it's very difficult with human tissue as well because she's sort of that way we guess. Um, but no, we didn't really see a major difference. Um, it's the lateral wall though that will retain the stem cells, like in mouse, same in human, um, and the medial wall won't. Um, but we see any differences in sex differences in the composition? Yeah, yeah that's you know, that's one of our we haven't looked at sex differences um, in mice and um, actually we are doing, <clears throat> that's, that's not true. We do have it for um, this um, predictive modeling study. We have both sexes and right now, no, we don't see any difference. In human, um, we just future. don't have enough tissue to make a, a conclusion on that. So right now we don't see any, but until we put all the numbers together, it's um, but I, I don't think so in, in mouse at all. At least there's nothing like grossly. Any more questions from the audience? Uh, my last question. Just wondering if there was uh, any sort of like difference in the uh, stem cell dynamics between the mice models with like hydrocephalus versus the ones if you shunted any of them. Yeah, we didn't shunt any of the mouse models of hydrocephalus. I mean, that is something that we will do. Um, what we found is, um, and, and this is still a work in progress, that um, in, and this, the model that we're using is post-infectious, and so we're using flu as an agent to cause hydrocephalus. That's our model for hydrocephalus. And so um, what we find is that um, there's, if there's extensive enlargement as predicted, there's astrogliosis. But we also see because 
um, the mice still have stem cells along the periphery of those of the astrogliosis because that's like a quick fix. Um, there's stem cell proliferation and, and they're generating and new appendable cells are being generated there. It's just that like in any situation, like if you, if you have a cut in your skin, you, it, the stem cells can't replace everything all at once and you'll have a scar. So there are, if it's too extensive, there'll be a scar, but around the periphery, as long as there's stem cells, there's the capacity to generate new appendable cells. If you can generate new appendable cells, then you sort of get your system back at least to some um, more workable uh, situation than um, if you just have scar in there. Yeah, but the shunting, yeah, that's something that we want to do as well because we want to make it as authentic to what's going on and try and figure out what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. We have this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please take some food.